Welcome to John's Big Adventure. John is helping me put up my 6 meter antenna today so that hopefully I'll be able to test out the swan on the local 6 meter net tonight. So I'm going to be filming this so that you can watch John put the antenna up. And uh, he's putting up a uh, par omni angle 6 meter antenna, the OE50, which is a good omnidirectional antenna. I'm not sure PAR even makes it and sells it anymore, but... And you'll have to forgive the shakiness of this video because I'm doing the filming instead of John. <laughs> uh, I'm letting John do this because he's a little better with heights than I am. At least as far as being steady on the ladder and uh, hopefully this won't uh, end up on America's dumbest videos And there she is, way, way up in the sky. <laughs> Let's see if I can get far enough back here All right. so I can get a good shot. And I hope I'm getting a decent shot of this because I got the sun right in my eyes. So I can't see anything on the screen here. But anyway, that's what it looks like. Here, come over this side. Right here you can shoot the whole thing. You won't be, be glared out. I would say right here, that way you've got a sky background and you can see what you're needing to see. What you think? Oh, yeah, okay. Right. <clears throat> okay, well here it is. Hopefully you can see this well enough. And this one right over here is my two meter J pole. So. Alright, well that's done. Now all we have to do <coughs> is finish running the coax into the radio room. And once we've done that, we can bring the Swan 250 into the radio room and get it all hooked up and ready to go. Well, greetings and welcome to my modest little radio shack. I thought I would give you just a quick little tour uh, before we get into uh, hopefully testing the Swan 250 on the air this evening. Uh, as you can see, uh, I have uh, a few radios here that uh, cover pretty much most of the uh, ham bands and, and such. And one of my power supplies up there. Uh, next to that, you can probably see my um, little 2 meter handheld. That's an Olenko DJ G1T. That's the very first ham radio that I ever bought when I first got my license back about 1994. Um, so, and it has been the best little handheld you can imagine. And I'll never get rid of it. And then there's a little, little 45 amp power supply. And then down here you can see my HF rig. It's a and on another Alenco, a DX70 shack in the box. 
uh, pretty much it covers all the hand bands plus I think it was I think it covers uh, either 80 or 160 which I don't use through uh, 10 plus it has six meters so it's a it's a decent little rig and below that is my MFJ mighty fine junk automatic antenna tuner and I have that mostly because the uh, the HF antenna I have is a very compromised no no radial vertical which is the best I could do uh, around here at least when I, I got here and got set up and it requires the extended tuning range that that MFJ has in order to make it work on, uh, efficiently on most of the bands. It's just the way it is. I know I should have a better antenna, but it's what I have for now. And with it, I've been able to talk all around the world. This is my vintage Kenwood 7950 2 meter mobile rig that I use for my base rig for checking into the local 2 meter nets and uh, talking on it whenever there's anybody on it to talk to which isn't very often with two meters these days at least not around here but I picked this up at a ham fest uh, several years ago for I think I paid 30 35 dollars for it and it's worked like a champ I did have to go in and replace the uh, the bulb uh, but you know for lighting it up but that was it and it's done wonderfully. Now we come over here to the Swan 250 which is what we're here to to see and check out on the air hopefully. And then coming around over here the last one we have that is my vintage all tube uh, heavy duty boat anchor Halicrafters SX99 general coverage receiver and that one I re fully restored to uh, working condition and also added some improvements uh, like a fuse and a surge limiter and, and some things like that and it works like a champ that's what I use for most of my shortwave listening and in fact I have that hooked up to a slinky dipole that I've had up here in the uh, garage stretched out for a number of years and while it may not be as good as an outdoor antenna um, you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference uh, this thing works like a champ for shortwave listening so anyway that uh, pretty much takes care of the tour of my shack I went uh, also, uh, you can see my bulletin board here with uh, various maps of different countries with pens in them showing uh, who I've talked to over the last several years, you know, along with a few other things. Uh, I used to have a bunch of QSL cars displayed on the wall, but I ran out of room, so I took them down until I can come up with a better place and way to display them. So anyway... That's my shack, and welcome to it. The next uh, time that uh, you'll see me here is going to be in about an hour when the, the Sand Lapper 6 meter net starts up. If it starts up, if it starts up on time, that's not always a sure thing. And um, in the meantime, I'm letting my uh, swan get thoroughly warmed up then I'll get it uh, tuned up and uh, then we'll just wait for the sideband 6 meter net to start and hopefully we'll get a good on air test and we'll get it on video so until then uh, I'll see you in a moment okay welcome back to the swan restoration project been a little while uh, since I updated this and so I'll bring you up to date we had gotten we had thought we got it done got it all buttoned up everything done I took it out to the shack and hooked it up to my six meter antenna and was going to try it out on the air on the local six meter sideband net 
uh, and turned out that uh, there was a problem with the receive. The problem was it wasn't receiving anything at all. <laughs> so we just just had just had hiss and static. It wasn't receiving any kind of signal at all. Didn't know what might have happened to it, so brought it back here into the bench and started to look it over. Thought uh, I was afraid it was going to be something serious and uh, something uh, involving one of the uh, one of those parts made from unobtainium, something like a like a coil or that sort of thing. But as it turned out, it turned out to be really simple. Uh, the this is V7. This is the mixer tube, the 6HA5. We we started pushing around on her. I should say John did. This was uh, his find, and he pushed on it and found out that when he he moved it around in the socket, lo and behold, the receive level came up and down and up and down as he moved it. Turns out the only problem this thing had as far as the receive goes was a dirty tube socket. So we pulled the tubes, all the tubes, we cleaned the pins on, on, the, on all the tube sockets, put everything back together. I went out to the ham shack, got on my Alinko, and uh, and did a transmit on a test transmit on the Alenco. Lo and behold, it started picking up the signal just fine, loud and clear. Well, loud, not necessarily clear. Uh, but we we solved the receive problem that way. Um, so if you're having a, you know a, a, a mysterious problem where you're not receiving a signal but you're getting hiss, that'd be the first thing I would check would be the tube sockets. Now this still needs a good alignment of both the transmitter and the receiver. Uh, so we, we're going to go ahead and try to attempt to do that before we put it back on the air. Another thing that we're going to do, and we'll be detailing this later in this update, uh, during my research on possible causes of the receive problem, I ran across another um, another recommended upgrade modification that uh, should increase the uh, frequency stability even further, and that is there are some uh, resistors in the uh, grid circuit that the the uh, the frequency uh, and the drift can be improved. If you replace the 10% resistors uh, in that circuit with matched pairs of uh, high tolerance resistors, so I've got uh, I've bought some 1% resistors and the values that go in that circuit, and I'm going to re to replace those with uh, matched pairs of the 1%. So the difference between the 10% error resistors and the 1% precision resistors should go a long way towards stabilizing the frequencies um, in this unit and uh, we're going to be doing that modification next and so um, we'll come back and, and uh, show you more about that in just a moment. Okay, uh, we're back and we're just going to show you um, what modification that we're talking about for um, increasing the stability of this rig. And there are three pairs of matched resistors uh, that are on the balanced modulator circuit. Um, and uh, those uh, resistors were there are four 47k ohm resistors and two 100k ohm resistors, and it was recommended to replace those. Their 10% uh, uh, error. It was recommended to replace those with a higher tolerance um, 
a tighter tolerance resistors and to match the resistors up in pairs as close as you can and that's what we've done and we haven't replaced them yet I wanted to show you the before picture and uh, let uh, John will point out where those resistors are and I'm going to tell you what resistors those are um, the pairs of resistors if you look at your um, your parts list in your manual and on your schematic you're going to be list looking to match up the following pairs you want to match R1302 with R1303 you also want to match up R1305 with R1309 and lastly you match up R1306 with R1310 and what I did I just bought a couple of five packs of the 1% error a quarter watt uh, or half watt I forget um, resistors and we went through them with the uh, multimeter and we paired up the ones that were the closest match in value and so those are the ones we're going to use after we get done replacing those with the new ones then we'll come back and we'll give you a shot of what that looks like Okay, John the Master Solderer has finished his usual fine job of soldering and getting into them tight little places that my shaky hands can't get into. And we have replaced those six resistors, or basically uh, you'd call them those uh, three resistor pairs, uh, matched up as close as we could get them. All the little blue ones you see, those are the ones we were, that are the replacements. That's in the balanced modulator circuit, and this is this is a modification that's supposed to help stabilize the uh, frequency and, and make it drift a lot less. Uh, all tube transceivers are known for drifting a certain amount, um, but uh, I believe that uh, the modifications we've done to this is going to go a long way toward stabilizing that that habit and making it a whole lot um, less drift. Now this is, um, at this point, this is all the upgrades and modifications that uh, I'm aware of to do to this. Our next step is going to be to do the receiver and transmitter alignments. Um, the, our only problem is that uh, the instructions call for the use of an oscilloscope which uh, I neither have nor know how to use and unfortunately neither does John so we're going to have to try to wing it with a multimeter uh, volt ohm meter vacuum tube voltmeter uh, and um, an RF generator and what other whatever other um, instruments we can bring into use for this and do the best alignment that we're able to do with the equipment we have available. So um, once we get to work on that, we'll come back and update you again. So until then, see ya. Hold on to your butt.